Sweet. Thanks, Raji. All right. So, um, yeah, so we're going to go over like a wide range of things today. Um, but I thought just to kind of kick it off and to get everyone on the same level and to maybe share a tip that's that's kind of generally helpful is to start with an example for uh, buttons, like something we're all probably making and working with in Figma. Um, so I wanted to start with an example here uh, where I've got a frame on the canvas and I have just a simple kind of button inside. And this is really, I wanted to illustrate this just because this is really how I think of components. Um, uh, in terms of kind of composing new components from old components or existing components. And what I mean by that is oftentimes like you have, um, it might make sense to kind of have like a structural button on the canvas and then, uh, or a structural kind of component button on the canvas and then to have all of these other instances that are kind of taken from that um, original one. And the reason is if you want to ever change anything on the original structure or all of your buttons, you only have to do it once. So. I thought just to kind of kick things off and to maybe for a more easy example, we could walk through kind of creating that component and then creating lots of instances from it. So like I said, I have a little base button here and just so everyone's familiar, uh, just to, when you actually want to create a new component, all you have to do is right click on this and then choose create component or option command K if you're on a Mac. Um, I believe that's alt command or alt windows key, alt control K, something like that if you're on uh, windows. So I'm going to go ahead and create this component. And the first thing that I actually want to point out is, uh, I, again, this component is inside of a frame that's called buttons. So I actually don't even need to worry about naming this component, this button here, like button slash base or, or base button or anything like that that has the word button inside of it because it's already inside of this frame. And you'll notice, um, let's see if I can do this real quick. If I make an instance of it and I go to our instance swapping menu over here, you'll see that in our buttons page, um, we have right away base. So it's just kind of a, a way to save you a little bit of time there. And this will be a little bit more, um, this will be a little bit more obvious once we start making a couple of examples. So I just wanna call that out. All right, so let's pretend that we've got our base button here and something that you might do kind of to start off with is to create a primary button. So in this case, what I'm going to do, ooh, option, or alt control K, thank you, Joe. Um, that's the shortcut for creating a new component on Windows. So I, what I want to do is I want to create a new primary button component. So all I did was I made a copy of this original main component, and I've got an instance right here. And just to really show that if I change anything on the main component, it's going to be reflected in the instance. The thing about Figma that um, honestly, like I just kind of fell in love with to start with, uh, is that you can always create new components from existing instances like I just talked about. So in this case, I'm actually just going to right click on this instance here and choose create component from the list. And now you'll see I have a new main component. And if I click this drop down, I have the instance inside, which is this component right here. And the reason that this is powerful is because I can now click on this instance and I can actually style this a little bit. So let's say maybe our fill for this, uh, for maybe all of our primary buttons is going to be, uh, let's choose, I don't know, let's choose like a light blue, something like that. Um, maybe we can change the, the text color as well. So we've got something like that. And let's just imagine like for all of our primary buttons, this is what we want that to look like. And just to kind of illustrate this a little bit further, let's create a secondary button, just again, by creating an instance of this original main component here, dragging it away a little bit, doing the exact same thing. So right clicking, choosing create component. And then, you know what I realized, I actually wanna rename this here just so we can tell these apart a little bit. So I'm actually gonna call this primary. And with this new main component, I'm gonna call this one uh, secondary, something like that. And with the secondary button, again, we can kind of style this a little bit. So maybe for our secondary button, maybe we've got like a little bit darker of a background there. Um, perhaps on this one, we also maybe lighten that stroke just a little bit. So maybe we've got something like that. And again, the reason that I'm doing this is now because imagining this is maybe a, a frame in our design system or one of our kind of UI files. Uh, well, I can actually grab an instance of this, drag it somewhere else on the canvas. And using the instance swapping menu over here on the right hand side, I can now really easily swap between my primary state and my secondary state just like that. Um, and what's really cool about this is, again, like let's imagine that maybe as a design team, um, we want to adjust all of our border radii to be, uh, in, we want to maybe adjust them from this five uh, pixel corner radius to, let's just say 100 to be completely rounded. Well, I only have to do that once, again, on the original main component that everything was composed of, and all of these are going to change to match it. 
Um, you can even do the same thing. Like maybe I wanted to uh, drop the text size down a little bit. Seems kind of large. I can drop this down to 18 and all of these are going to be reflected and I can center these up inside. Um, so just kind of a, a quick, I, I guess like this is kind of like my own philosophy as I create components, I try to think about, um, which you'll see in a lot of examples, I try to think about what can I start with and what can I compose new components off of? That way if I ever wanna change something, I only just have to do it once. Um, and then just a quick little shortcut that we'll probably use a couple of times today is, uh, this is kind of easy because we can see the instance and we can see the original kind of main component over here. But when you're in your files working, if you ever want to really quickly get back to where that main component is, you can always select an instance and then choose go to main component over here on the right hand side, which will take you directly to where that uh, component lives. If it's in a new file um, or if it's in a new project, it'll take you right into it. Um, so I just want to show that as well. Raji, do you do, do you do something similar like when you're making components? I know it's uh, it can kind of vary by, by designer, but um, yeah, I'm curious if this kind of aligns with what you do too. Yeah, because I'm a pro, I do it exactly like you. Exactly. <laughs> um, I have ran into a little bit of the, um, some issues with the idea of a structure component. I really love it in general, but I have ran into some, I wouldn't call them limitations, um, but I think as you nest components more and more and more, it can get a little bit unwieldy to work with sometimes. And I think that's always a question I'd have to ask myself as a design system designer is, hey, I've made this incredibly flexible, amazing, auto layouted, whatever component, but like, is it too complex to work with? Like, are my designers like to call having that, to like um, drill in? I like to call that job security. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like where you no, actually I'm totally have to explain kidding. Don't each make component. Don't that complex, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but generally I follow a similar structure and I really like how you uh, put them all in the same frame, of course, to have the same names. And then, of course, uh, the swap menu is so easy. It's not yeah. too huge. I hate drilling down into that huge menu where I have to know the whole hierarchy. I love having those related ones right there in the swap. Yeah, another tip, just kind of speaking of swap before we get into uh, making even more components is, uh, so let's say like I had this secondary button on the canvas here and perhaps I changed the text inside, like I said, hello. Um, you can always actually swap components in Figma really easily or swap instances in Figma really easily, I should say, um, not only by using the instance uh, swapping menu over here, but also if I go to the assets tab up here, and let's say in this case, I'll just search for primary, which will launch and pull up our primary button here. Um, I can actually hold option and command and drag this right on top of that instance, which will uh, just swap it out entirely. So we can see now that I've got my secondary one um, with the, the primary inside. And actually let me undo that just to see if I can make this a little bit cleaner. So we can hold, uh, I think just the command key in this case, or the option key in this case, and swap it directly, which is going to swap right on top of our secondary button. So what's cool about that that you might have noticed is we changed that text inside for the secondary button. And when we did the swap, so I'll undo that and kind of redo it. So we, this is our secondary button, we swapped it, and this text stayed the same. So you can actually preserve overrides by swapping them that way, which is pretty cool. We did have a few questions related to what you're talking about now, Joey. Um, one's from, yeah. and I'm really sorry if I butchered your name, but his Sing or Sing Yu Yang. Uh, uh, they're particularly interested in the naming of each layer in a component. What's the naming principle uh, you find most useful? So I think they're talking about the layers within the component. Definitely. Yeah, there's so many things that you can do here. And I actually think maybe to illustrate that a little bit more, I'll take us to this input page right here. Um, and this is a little bit bigger of a file. And uh, just another kind of quick, I'll explain some keyboard shortcuts that I use throughout just in case you might be familiar. But uh, I just hit the UI and all of that was was command period or command backslash. So I can bring the UI back and hide it. I use this a lot for kind of presenting maybe on screen or again, kind of like the live demo that we're doing now. But um, I wanted to take us to this file, I think for that question, because this kind of addresses maybe a couple of ways that I think about naming components in Figma. Um, so one thing that I like to do when I, when I kind of build out design systems that you'll maybe notice if you've ever used one of my iOS or, or Mac OS kits is, I like to include the name of the component just above where the component sits. And this absolutely isn't necessary, but the reason that I do it is for anyone who's, a, who's not perhaps a designer who's viewing the file or maybe someone who's not familiar with the component naming structure, um, I just think it's helpful to kind of include that name on top so that they're not relying directly on the name in the layer list. It definitely takes a little bit of extra work, but it's kind of nice in these examples where you can see, all right, yeah, this one is a check slash empty, this is a check slash build, 
and you can kind of see without having to click and, and then kind of reference the layer list what um, what components you're actually looking at. And if I bring back the UI, let's say I select this one here and I bring back the UI, this is how this looks over here in the layers list. I just have this little uh, text uh, label here and then of course our component down here. So when I get into thinking about naming, I like to think about um, it's all kind of like a usability uh, challenge, right? Because when you're thinking about components, it's you're building them for you, but you're probably more often building them for others on your team. And I think the challenge is thinking about if I were a designer on a team and I'm looking for, let's say, a checkbox or, or some sort of component, what, like, what would I search for? How would I, what would make sense for me to kind of drill down into and where would I maybe expect to find something like this? So I like to think a lot about kind of these top level frames to kind of get into the category and then to drill a little bit deeper by uh, kind of um, uh, adding another layer on top of what you're looking at. So for example, if I just take one of these and I'll make a copy of it and go up here, we can see that on the canvas here, I have a couple of high level frames, again, just kind of for categories for different things. But if I go into the layer list, we can see that as I go down here and I go to inputs, we can see these are all broken up by the frame name. And then just for an example, if we go into checkboxes, I can see, again, thinking like the user, thinking as someone who's kind of consuming this design system, I'm looking at a checkbox. Do I want one with a check or with text? Maybe it's just the check that I, the kind of the, the container box that I need, or actually I may need something with a label, uh, for instance. And in this case, we can go checkbox with text, and now I can swap between empty and filled. And how you're actually, uh, how these kind of names are being derived are simply just slashes in the actual name. So with this menu up, you can actually see on the right hand side over here, we have a checkbox that's called with text slash empty. And we can see that kind of uh, playing out over here in this instance swapping menu as well. Um, so that's really, uh, that's kind of how I think about namings. It's like trying to put yourself in the perspective of a user who's who might be consuming the design system or the components that you're building and just trying to think about what keywords would they think about, where would they kind of expect to find these things, and then just slash naming kind of your way through. Um, I saw a question about our emojis that we're using on the, the pages. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of funny, but that was just a way for Raji and I to divide up who's going to be speaking about what, if you're curious. We had a hard time choosing these emojis, so they might change. <laughs> Uh, one thing I was noticing too, Joey, and I, I think it's kind of like a subtlety that you just get used to in Figma. If you take one of your master components, let's say a checkbox, and you drag it outside of that frame, yeah. uh, you'll notice, so if you take the main component there and drag it actually out, uh, outside of the frame, yep. you'll notice that, well, this one's very small, but you'll notice that the label for that component is there. Uh, right, exactly. We have check filled there, which is really nice because you can just read it right on the canvas. Unfortunately, as soon as you place those things into a frame, the nuance here is that those disappear. Those little frame labels disappear when they're in a subframe, which is why I really like, uh, I like Joey's system of putting the label above it to help people with like accessibility. But at the same time, uh, then you still get that gain of being able to like have all of your checkbox types in that checkboxes frame and let that auto name all of that and group it for you in that frame. Yeah, it's definitely a little bit of extra work, but again, just trying to think about, um, you know, many of us use our design systems as ways to, of course, like hold and contain all of our components, but you also have to think about, um, perhaps there's a case of an engineer who is working in a file and they choose go to main component to see perhaps like what overrides the designer is applied. Um, allowing them to come into a file that looks a little bit like this in some ways, and I'm sure you all have like lots of improvements that you make over me, but like to be able to see these component names on top, I think just gives a little bit more of like a visibility into um, just the design process and to see how they're named and, and to not have to, again, rely on that layers list so much. So I just, I, I, you know, I, I try to rely on like accessibility as much as I can and just thinking of someone who might not be as familiar with Figma or, or comfortable with Figma as um, either Raji and I are, and probably many of you in chat. So. Uh, a little bit of extra work, but I find it to be pretty rewarding. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to walk through uh, perhaps a couple of examples just to really show what I mean by instance swapping and how I built some of these uh, components here. So this is simply just a file and I'll hide the UI again. This is just a really basic file that I, I made and published to the community not too long ago that has a lot of kind of like starter elements for input. So things that you would commonly want to use in your design, but none of them are really styled. Like I wanted to build these so that you could take these, put them in your own design system, 
style them for your own kind of existing patterns in the UI and then publish them out. Um, so this is kind of a fun challenge to think about, all right, like what kind of elements would we need in their own design system and, and how could I build something like that for, for anyone to use? And so a lot of things that are, that are in here, uh, again, are like checkboxes and, and filled checkboxes and things like that. Um, but one that I wanted to focus on here uh, was actually the segment of control. This is one that gets a little bit more complex because uh, in this one, I'm actually using something called a layout grid in Figma. And to show you what that looks like, let's actually grab this main component here. And just for now, I'm gonna drag it off. And to show you how this works, I'm going to make a copy of it. So here's my main component, here's an instance of it. I can do things like change the text. I could say on, or in this case, off, and kind of customize this a little bit. And the thing that I wanna highlight here is if I drag this left and right and make it really, really small, it looks like this actually needs fixed. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna style this to the left, something like that. So I can bring this really, really, really small, do the same on here. Um, I'm actually using layout grids to do this. And if I enable layout grids just by doing control G or going up to the menu up here and choosing to show uh, where are we at? Layout grids right here. You can actually see that I've built a layout grid on top of this, which is a two column layout grid. And I'll show you what this looks like actually when I remove it, just so we can kind of see a before and after. So here's our stretched component. I can make it really small and I'll make another instance actually and just make it really big. And if we go back to this main component and remove this layout grid, things kind of break. They break really quickly. And the reason for this is because when you apply a layout grid, that is a grid uh, you know, that's kind of on top of the component everything inside of that layout grid, uh, all of the constraints that are applied in that layout grid are going to apply just to the grid. So for example, I have a grid on the right, I have a grid on the left, and all I've done is I've said for this item on the left, I want it to always be centered in this column on the left. And for this item on the right, I want it to, in this case, always be um, centered on the right-hand side, something like this. And for this one, I've actually just not applied any constraints that way it kind of stretches left and right. Um, but this is really helpful. Again, like I can go down here and I can show you that I have a three um, option segment of control. And if I duplicate this and, and drag it up just a little bit, I can make this really small. And you can actually see I made a mistake here. So let's fix this. For all of these, we can see that this is actually breaking because it's stretching left and right. I actually just wanna set all of these to center. And again, it's going to center all of those text uh, labels in the layout grid for the three columns. So now, regardless of the size that I have, they're always going to stay. Um, also thinking about something like, uh, I'm just gonna jump ahead really quick and then we'll come back to this file, but another example of this is uh, in the iOS kit that I made. Uh, with layout grids enabled still, you can see that the same thing is happening down here. So if I drag this out, the reason that I wanted to use a layout grid is because our screen width can change, right, in all of our designs. And I wanted these to always be distributed evenly. So if I make this larger or if I make this smaller, uh, in this one, it's much easier to see that all of the actual tabs stay exactly centered in their own grids. And again, if I were to click on this, this original main component here, and if I remove this layout grid, well, we can see that it breaks. Um, and this, in the case for, for breaking now is because we have a frame inside uh, that's kind of stretching left and right, but all of these items in this, and inside that, all of those navigation items, they're not really sure what to do. And without a layout grid, you might think like, you know what, uh, maybe for the two on the right, I always want them to be on the right-hand side here, and I always want the center one to be center, and on these on the left, I always want them to be up to the left. But then you get something like this, and it's not possible to really do this easily without a, uh, without a layout grid. So just to kind of undo this, uh, let's go back here, and I'll kind of show you from the, from the start how I would apply something like this. So um, if I apply a layout grid on this tab frame, I'll just choose layout grid, and by default, Figma will give you a grid of eight pixels, but all I did was I switched this to be columns, and then it looks like we have five, but they're a little bit uneven. So all I wanna do is I'm just gonna bring this gutter down to one, which is going to stretch them properly. And then, uh, so now that we have a layout grid, just to kind of quickly explain again, we have these five columns, and I can take all of these tabs that are inside of these columns and just set them to be centered both vertically and horizontally. And now if I go up here, we can see that our instance is totally fixed. Um, so this is kind of one of those maybe little known tricks in Figma, but if you are working with tabs, any sorts of navigation, any sorts of things where you wanna stretch and shrink them and you want the uh, distribution to be even, this is so helpful. And once I learned it, it, uh, 
it's hard to go back to doing anything else. So just wanted to share that. I feel like these layout grids too are such a hidden thing. Like I didn't, I've been designing in Figma for like three years <laughs> before I realized like, oh wow, you could actually have a layout grid on your desktop mockup and have like a fluid width items that are like yeah. honoring gutters and margins. Like that just kind of blew my mind. And that was like two months ago. You know, and something else that's pretty cool is I'm actually going to take us back to this iOS kit here. Um, so we've applied a layout grid, right? If we click on the tabs again and we're looking at the one that we just had, we've applied one. Um, something that you can also take advantage of is actually creating this layout grid or publishing this layout grid as a part of your own design system. And it's really easy to do this actually just using styles, which everyone might be familiar with. Um, styles, you can turn uh, elements such as fill and stroke and uh, effects and drop shadow things into repeatable styles. But you can actually do the same thing for layout grids. So for example, if I want to create like a, a reusable five column layout grid for everyone on the design system to use and reference, I can just click this little styles icon here, click the plus, and then in this case, I'll just call this five call, I'll create my style, and now I always have this to reference. So if I remove this entirely and I want to add it back, so there's no layout grid, if I want to add it back, I can just select the styles icon, click this, and we're good to go. And again, I can publish this out to my entire team if I want. Um, so again, just kind of thinking of reusable elements, how do you make the lives of others easier? You can imagine creating grids for like one column to 10 columns if, if that's something that's applicable. But um, yeah, I, I just really wanted to share this. I, I hope it's useful for uh, those who are creating kind of elements like this. One thing that uh, I saw a question go by in the chat, theoretically speaking, do you think that you could actually design a table row and say set up a 10 column grid? Now, obviously they're gonna all be the same width uh, mm -hmm. each column, but do you think you could design something like that in that way to where like all of those columns now will honor that 10 column grid? Yeah, definitely. Um... You could cool. absolutely do that. Yeah, like uh, I don't know if this example covers it. I have a couple of tabs open over here with a couple of different um, kind of table examples from the community that we can share out. But uh, you could absolutely do that because uh, again, the point of layout grids and just thinking about them is you have a bunch of items inside perhaps a row or a column and you wanna think about if the content or the user manually stretches or shrinks that, uh, that item can all of those say distributed at the same um, distance uh, or, or kind of in a, in a distance that's um, proportional to everything else. And as we were kind of seeing without a layout grid, you know, for example, like these are always gonna go to the left, this is gonna stay center, these are gonna go to the right. Um, but once you have it, you can put any content inside and kind of create a new way of actually using constraints in Figma. So definitely. Uh, and one, we have a slew of questions. So. Yeah. I think we'll try to move through the content, but also maybe tack on questions at the end. But one that's uh, kind of works for what you're talking about right now, Ash Guillaume said, uh, layout grids work, do they work for all items? Like component instances, frames, can you do them on shapes? Can you do them on oh, yeah. groups? Like what, what can you use a layout grid on? So you'll notice, um, let's say I create like a couple of rectangles here. I can't, if I select either one of these, I can apply a layout grid directly on them. And the other limitation is if I create a group, you'll notice I can't apply a layout grid either. Um, layout grids are only going to be for items that are frames. So for example, if I convert this group into a frame, just by going up here to the dropdown and selecting this to be a frame, we can now see if I drop this down here, we've got our two rectangles. And now on the right-hand side, I can apply a layout grid. And the reason for that is because layout grids really only come in handy when you're able to use constraints just to really take advantage of them and frames are the way to do that. So uh, if you don't see the option for a layout grid, you can simply just convert it into a frame, which really doesn't detract from the experience in any way. It just gives you a, a couple more options in that way. Um, and then the other thing you'll notice is that if you're using auto layout, so for example, if I take this frame and let's say I apply on layout so I can do things like I can set a fill in this and I can change the padding on the left and on the right. Uh, this is gonna bother me. So I'm gonna do 24 and 24. You'll notice that you can't do layout grids on here either. And the reason for that is because auto layout is kind of superseding all constraints and all grids that would be possible. So um, they're helpful in, in the cases where you have something like a tab bar or just items that you wanna quickly distribute, make sure. Um, otherwise, you're probably gonna get a lot of mileage out of creating an auto layout container that can stretch left and right, things like that. Awesome. Yeah, great question. Also, feel free to always hit either Raji and I up on, on, on Twitter or email or whatever works. Like, we're so happy to answer questions like this. It's pretty fun for us. 
Absolutely. Uh, Joey, I'll leave you to uh, the chat and the Q&A. Uh, there's oh. a bunch of Q&A that you might be able to answer sort of just by typing. And I will do my very best to be able to deliver my content succinctly so that we can get to as many questions as possible. Thanks, Raji. Hey, thank you, Joey. We'll do a little bit of round robin back between Joey and I. Uh, okay, so for the first thing, uh, I just wanted to talk about basically constraints uh, and how you can use them. So I don't know if you all saw, uh, we, there was a friend named Ali. He put out this like big book library thing and I designed a little book component for it. And so the book component is pretty simple. Uh, we've got a lot of different things that I've locked down here uh, over in the left here in our layers, but it's a series of things like you would think it is. Um, all these little rectangles within here are just linear gradients uh, meant to overlay this book. And the only thing I wanted to talk about here is just remember that like components can be anything. They could be graphical components. They could be illustrations potentially with uh, constraints put on them, but they could also be uh, like what we understand them commonly now as like cards and inputs and things like that, little, little uh, interface input elements. So with this book component, pretty simple. Um, I just set up each one of these little gradients uh, to have constraints. So in this case, uh, the constraint for this little seam or whatever we want to call that, the edge of the, uh, I'm sure there are some book scholars that know exactly what this is, but where the binding is, uh, I've just set those constraints to left and top and bottom. And that way, whenever I make a copy or uh, create an instance of this component, you'll see it in action. You'll see that uh, those constraints are honored and this gradient stays on the top. And then of course, when I resize this way, you'll see that, uh, that this little edge of this skeuomorphic book here where the shadow drops off, that's all set up in the same way. Uh, so using constraints. Uh, in that way, we're able to create uh, a lot of different looking books, but like with the, same, with the same component. So you can see here that all I did with this component, this is why I actually locked down all of these layers here is because those are all sort of effects that I have on here. I don't really want people messing with those effects, but really what I want them to do is when they click into this or command click right here, I want them to go right to that image because that's the item that they need to change. So I've just locked this layer here. So, uh, and if, if you could imagine if it was unlocked, I would come in here and click this and I might end up actually clicking other elements. Let me actually unlock all of these things here, just dragging up to make that easy for me. But if I were to do this, notice that I'm actually touching those uh, and selecting those layers that I don't really want to select. Really what I want to do is get down to this element here. So I'm going to uh, lock that layer here. I'm getting all lost with my instances. And then of course I can just select this thing and put in a new image. And then in this way I can actually resize and everything kind of stays cool and good because of my constraints. So I can just resize to where I think it fits the book. Boom, there, and it's the same component for a lot of different things. Uh, the next thing I wanna talk about is uh, a little bit of wizardry. Uh, when I first started with Figma, this is a component that I made for Dribbble. So I actually grabbed it right from their design system. This was a little range slider um, for their promoted shots, and they needed to be able to say like, hey, I wanna be able to have like a, a thousand impressions, and this little slider would allow you to do that. Well, I didn't know how to make this thing, if any of you have noticed with components, you can't really override in an instance, you can't really override like this little, uh, this little pink area here. So if I were to move this this way in the master component or the main component, it works fine. But in an instance, if I were to come in here and try to resize it, it's locked down. Those dimensions are locked down. And that's kind of how Figma processes and handles uh, components. So what I did here, has actually created a little auto layout container. And this was my first attempt at saying, I want this thing to be usable by designers so that they can actually like input a different value and simulate something like, what is it like when it's all the way at the end? So I put in some instructions here, type here to resize. So it's actually invisible text. And then you can actually type in here. <laughs> I'm just random smattering of characters in there, but you can do that. Uh, that was my first attempt at making uh, something like a slider component a little bit more usable uh, as opposed to just like always having to slam this thing in to your design system or into your mockups and then detaching. I really don't want people to have to detach 
because if I update this, they won't get those updates. So this is my next attempt at a progress slider here, and I kind of want to explain the anatomy of this one here. So this progress slider has a, uh, a rectangle on the background. I'm going to go ahead and turn this uh, to white so we can kind of see what this looks like on white. Uh, this background I have set to left and right and top and bottom. Now I'm not using auto layout at all on this progress bar on the out the main frame here. So what happens here is if I just drag this this way and this way, um, I can resize it the way I want to. Now right here I have a little auto layout frame. And in that flame, frame, uh, there's a little bit of some wizardry here. Um, I will have this handle here, which is just a regular frame uh, with some effects applied to it. But this one here, I've actually got a, uh, another frame, but inside of it, now this is a little bit hacky, like I said, but inside of it, there's just a single object inside, uh, and this makes auto layout work. So if I'm able to use this spacing value here, this horizontal padding, I can actually use this to change. So this is like V2 of my progress bar slider. If I come in here and I select this here, I can even have some instructions here or instructions on my actual instance here. I could say, hey, to use this, do this. Or I could actually graphically place them in my design system so that people could see how to use this. But this is how this one works. I can actually change this auto layout value here and it'll actually move this right along. Now I don't need, need to use that text, that invisible text area here. Maybe in the future Figma will allow us to override those things, but for now this gives me an instance that I'm able to be able to modify information within it because this uh, Figma still honors this uh, horizontal padding even within instances. Uh, and lastly, uh, another similar thing we could do here is create sort of like a iOS uh, or like an Apple Watch like progress indicator. So what I've done here is I've just created three arcs with different gradients on there. So these three different circles you can see here that I can actually adjust that sweep and those three different circles uh, are just literally there's not a lot of complexity to this at all. Now this one is going to be a little bit easier for us because when I make an instance of this uh, in the same way where we have these text values here to, uh, to change the sweep or the arc or whatever, I can actually just override those right in the instance. So if I come into the instance here, I can actually change any one of these. And I now have like a reusable component. I could potentially have multiple rings in here, turn them off and on, uh, and now I have my brand colors built in, but I can actually like extend this and use this in ways throughout my system. So I thought this was a really, really cool example of how you can actually create like some dynamic layout stuff within your, uh, within your components. All right, I've got one other little trick for you, and then we'll move back to Joey. Joey, I'm going to pause for a second in case there is Q&A that we need to, to handle. Everyone's just really wondering how, how you do the things you do. That's mostly what's come in. Uh, people loved the uh, your trick that you shared about the layout grids, and I do too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's what we're gonna do. So, when when we're in a world where we're designing like very boring buttons, sorry, Joey, not trying to say anything against your buttons, but like button it's just shaming. kind of a boring <laughs> button shaming. But let's say we just put like a rounded radius and stuff like that on it. That's that's fine. That's easy to do in Figma. This radius thing is built right in. But what if you like me, love a good spirited button. Uh, what if you want to do like an art deco button like this? Or what if you want to do like a chamfered edge, uh, like a, a beveled edge button? I am going to show you a cool little trick that has to do with Boolean operations and then applying constraints within components to that. So let's just say I've got this rectangle here. Let's make it a cool color, um, this cool purple color. Now I'm just going to take these four little rectangles and I'm just going to chop them right out of this vector shape. So I'm going to do subtract selection. Yeah, what if this is like a, a cool sci-fi button that we have? And so now I wanna turn this into a button with a label. So this is naturally how I might do this. I would create a component out of this and be like, oh, this is a cool sci-fi button, sci-fi button. And I'm gonna put some text in there. Um, button, this button wants attention. It's a very thirsty button. So it will scream at you. Uh, but there's our button. How glorious is this button? All right, great. Let's go use it in our design system. 
So now I'm over here and I'm, whoa, whoa, wait, what, what's wrong with this button? Oh, oh, like my edges aren't, aren't, this is all skewed and nasty. Okay, first let's take this text and we'll go ahead and set it up to center and center. I always do this technique here where I have my component out and then I get it to see like how it's working. Oh, great, the center's working really good. But it's still, I really want for those things to be like exactly that angle there. I want that, that edge right, I don't want it to squish it. So check this out. I'm gonna come in here to my Boolean group and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to say, hey, for this, uh, for this main shape, I'm gonna set it to left and right and top and bottom. I'm gonna pin the edges. Now this one here, this little fella, it needs to be on the right and then the bottom. And I'm just gonna set up the constraints how you would expect. This one's gonna be at the right and the top. I always want it to be at the right and the top. And I'm working within a Boolean group. I know it's amazing and I love it too. So I'm gonna go left and bottom on this one and then I'm gonna go left and top on this one and then I'm gonna hope that those constraints just apply, they just work. Over here, let's see if the glory is beheld. And of course the glory is beheld. Check this out, nothing's changing here. Uh, it's not squishing because my constraints are actually happening within the Boolean group. And I don't need to break this one apart for you, but just to show you how this one was, it was actually constructed in the same way. So you can see that I've got this button and I've got all these effects, but really what's going on in this button is quite a few things masking and all kinds of stuff, but those constraints are still holding. I love this trick. It doesn't necessarily work out great within auto layout um, because you need this kind of background element, but I dig it. Uh, I hope that helps you. I'm passing this one back to Joey. That's seriously so cool. Um, that puts my button to shame too. Uh, just for anyone in chat, I'm just gonna, Raji, is it okay if I put a link to duplicate this file for everyone? Uh, that would be fantastic. I would love it if people could, could jump in. Yeah, awesome, all right, I just shared that out. So now you'll have a file uh, with that example kind of completed that you can uh, duplicate and add to your own library. Um, that's, yeah, seriously really cool. I'm gonna start, this is really up my button game too. <laughs> I'm gonna go <laughs> Come ahead. Come on, Joey, you've gotta drop them rounded racks, man. I know, I know, it's too easy. Um, cool, all right, just confirming, Raja, you can see this, right? I can see everything and it's glorious, keep so, going. All right. Cool. So uh, what I've got here, what I wanted to walk through is really the ability to uh, just kind of share a couple of things that I was working on for the Mac OS uh, kit. So um, for example, uh, I, you know, I get a lot of questions like when kind of creating a UI kit, like where to start and, you know, perhaps like how, I guess like it can be a little bit overwhelming and, and how do you kind of like compose components. So um, I'm definitely not saying my way is perfect. I still have a lot to learn, but I at least wanted to share how I kind of approach something like this. Um, so, for example, this is maybe the most complex and unnecessary thing I've ever done. Uh, but I wanted to share, I made created graphic lights that you'll see in like Mac OS and Figma. And I did it in a way that basically allows you to get every kind of state of traffic light, whether you're using like the default theme or the grayscale theme. And the reason that I wanted to share this um, kind of out was because um, everything in this frame here was based off of this little base action, which is just simply a circle. And I did the exact same thing that we were kind of doing earlier uh, with our button example, where we can see here that, oh, it looks like I actually have an extra one in there. We can see here that I've created a new component that's just called default action slash close. And then inside, we just link back to the base action. And again, the reason is, um, I don't know why any, why you would want to change this afterwards, but it just makes it a little bit easier to ensure that everything is kind of based off of the same like pixel height and width. But if I ever wanted to change this, all of these change too. Um, really easily and I think I just added auto layout by accident so uh, ignore that but um, essentially all of these have that and uh, it was really easy for me to kind of go in and to create these groups so for example you can see like there's a grouping here it's based on the default action Mac OS theme uh, this one is not expandable so you don't see that that little green theme there and it's uh, of the light theme and you can go in and you can see that really all I did was I, um, I just swapped each one of these for the uh, kind of the action up here so I could take this center button here, and if I wanted to, I could really easily make this another close button, which might not make sense, but you can kind of see like where I was getting at here. It could be an expand, or it could be a minimize, or even like an inactive action. 
And I wanted to share this portion just because that's kind of how these over here came to be. They're all kind of like compositions of compositions. And for example, if I re-enable my UI and I'll just kind of show you maybe a, a more, this is where kind of that overwhelming component architecture gets to be. But over here, I have this component. And then inside, I'm basing this component off of our light theme over here. And then instead of I've got my grouping of traffic lights and I've got my window style that's applied to this theme right here. And the reason that I've done it this way is I can now, I'll go through actually how I created this in just a second, but I can go through and I can take one of these window menu items and I can swap these for active, inactive, or not expandable. And this is kind of the theme throughout, right? So I started by you really just kind of thinking of like what different items might you want up here? How, and then kind of as you go in this file a little bit deeper, you can start to see that they build up into something kind of real. So uh, in this case, if I duplicate it, I have um, a window right here that's totally stretchable and, and able to be changed. And if I bring my UI back, well, I can take this window and I can swap it for an inactive one or a not expandable one that's active. And just to show, you know, it seems kind of complex on the surface, but really if I go down into this instance, you can see that, well, at the top here, all I have is my uh, kind of title bar that we created here, and I set it to be the active state. And then down here, which is kind of the, the window container, I just have this background here. Um, and again, it makes it really easy for the user, like kind of thinking back to design systems and component creation. I'm trying to think if I'm a user of this file and I want to maybe swap out, like what's going to make the most sense for me to go in here, go to Big Sur, go to the window, and then start to see these different options that I could have. Um, so for example, if I wanted to swap a window, maybe I want this to actually be the light theme variant. Well, I could just go to window and I could see, do I want dark or do I want light? And if I'm on light, do I want the default accent or the grayscale accent? And let's just choose the default and I'll go for a blur window. You can see how this is getting kind of long, um, but you're really trying to think these, through these different states. So, so if I'm on a blur background, let's say I want to choose an active window. So I can choose that and then right away this refreshes and now I can swap between active, inactive, or not expandable kind of for the, uh, for the light theme here. Um, so this is the stuff that I really enjoy for some reason. I, I feel like it's pretty fun kind of repetitive work, but it, I think the, the really exciting part about it is you're kind of building a product for other users on your team to use or other kind of users of the file. And it's just really like fun and kind of good practice to think through kind of these naming conventions here and, and thinking through like, how do you want the user to maybe like, what would they want to swap through? Would they want to swap through active or inactive? Or do you think it's more likely that they would want to swap through dark and light mode? So maybe that should actually be kind of the trailing string there. Um, things like that can be really helpful and, and uh, just kind of fun to work on. So maybe just to share really quickly, all I did was um, I broke out some of these components over here. And I just wanted to quickly share like how I would uh, kind of compose something like this. So I've got a little practice frame here and maybe I'll just call this window practice so we can take advantage again of kind of our naming uh, tensions and the frames here. And I think what I'll do for this one is, so I've got my grouping, which is my default accent and my active state. Again, I could swap this between um, any of the groupings down here, whether active, inactive or not expandable for any of the themes. Um, but all I'm going to do is I'm going to make this kind of the main part of the component. So I want to right click, choose create component from the list, and I want to start dragging things kind of into this. So I'm going to drag my traffic lights in, and I think Mac OS, it's eight all around. Uh, I think that's right. Um, we can double check this down here. If I click on this and I hold the option key, it looks like eight all around there. And then I'm going to drag my window title in here as well. So just center this up. And kind of a, a trick that I like to do when I'm building components is I like to have my main component here. I'll duplicate it often, and then I'll just stretch it out really weirdly. Like I'll try to make really random sizes or, or just to try to like see like where's this break? Um, and for example, this looks okay right now, but like if you had accidentally set this to be on the right side and perhaps this wasn't center, but it was also on the right, you get, like creating an instance and stretching it out really weirdly just kind of shows you kind of quickly um, what do I need to fix? So I've got this example here. I can go back to my main component. I can select this and change this to be on the right side. Of course, center our title up just like that. And now we've got a window that seems to be working pretty well. And then the last thing I did to really compose this was I just took our frame here 
And I put this inside of our component. And uh, of course, now this isn't showing just because our, the size of our frame is a little bit too small. So what I want to do is I want to bring this up a little bit, something like that. And we can see now that the actual frame size for the component is smaller than the actual content within. And another trick for this is to go to um, uh, actually outline mode in Figma, which is just command Y. And when you hit command Y, you'll actually be able to see everything that's happening here, even if it's not shown directly on the canvas. So I know there's content behind it. And again, this is kind of a, a thing that I use pretty often just to double check is everything in frame that needs to be in frame. So to expand this, just in case you're not familiar, you can always go to the expand tool on the right hand side. This is called resize to fit. I'm going to click this. This is going to expand. I'm going to go back from outline mode, command Y. And I need to just put this above. And for this one, the background, I just want to stretch it top left, bottom, and right. And now I've got a pretty good thing here. Uh, so this is actually going to allow us to kind of expand and collapse that. And it looks like I actually just need to fix this here, bring this down a little bit. And I can choose this, and I can make this darker. And all right, this isn't quite perfect, but you can kind of see where I'm going here. So you're probably catching on too. This took a long time. Um, it's, it's something that I love working through, but it, it definitely takes a little bit of practice and time. But once you kind of find like uh, a way and a convention that works for you, it's, it's easier to fly through it. And not at all saying that my way is the right way. And that's actually kind of why I love components and design systems so much is because it can really vary by company um, and, and kind of designers. So I just wanted to at least kind of share my own practice here and uh, just share how components are kind of composed for me. Um, that, uh, that, yeah, that, um, that shortcut again was command Y to go into outline mode. And then, yeah, really all I did is, uh, you know, something that I, I kind of uh, like to do often as well for going from light to dark mode is uh, to actually get to this dark mode variant. All I did was I took my light mode variant, I made an instance of it, I placed it over here kind of in my dark mode space. I'll just do something like this now. Um, I chose to right click on it and create a new component of it. And then in this one, I just renamed dark or light to dark, set that, and then I started to style this. So just to practice here, I'll take the um, I'll take the all of the style that's applied to this dark one. You can copy it just by doing off and C. And then if I go up here on this one, we can go ahead, drill down a little bit, option command uh, V to paste that style. And now I've got my dark mode variant. And I can grab the title here, I can grab the style of that, paste that in here. And again, the reason that I'm doing that is because if I go over here and I change anything on the original, well, it's going to be reflected on all of these here, which kind of shows like how that composition is working, which is pretty cool. Um, even if this isn't that practical, it's pretty fun to do and, and kind of to see. So I just wanted to share that. Very cool. We are getting some feedback that uh, sometimes our video preview in Zoom is actually above and to the right in the UI. So I wonder if maybe we can't just like turn off our video and maybe that'll help that. Yeah, totally. I would rather these people see the UI than my face. Um, awesome. Uh, Joey, I think I have a game plan because we have so many questions. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to share a few things here, but uh, I think we'll go ahead and get done with the stream in about five, six minutes, but we'll, we'll tack on some additional time so that we can just rattle through questions. We've got a lot of people in here that are asking questions, so I'd love to be able to answer that. How's that, that sound? Great. Awesome, I'm into awesome. It. Uh, I'm into it too. I would love to uh, be able to answer these questions. Uh, so we're gonna share this file out later, but I think what's important about just showcasing some of these things is that remember when you're making a, a component, like in the case of this dialogue component, you can actually put things within this that can extend it. So in the case of this one, I actually created an auto layout, uh, horizontal auto layout container here, and I can actually tack on media for some context here. Uh, so I added this little slot, but I just hit it by default. And of course, I can turn things off and on here. I have this dialog close button. I can turn it off and on here as well. So I can sort of create an extensible component. Uh, and also, I think I actually did this this way as well. Um, Yes, I imported this, so it actually didn't, uh, didn't do it. But anything, I typically follow Joey's strategy as well. Like if I'm gonna have a footer element here, this element here, I typically wouldn't make it into being a, a frame. I would actually make it into be a component, pull that little component out, and then that way I can swap out things whenever I want to. 
So for instance, I could come into this footer bar and just swap that out with something else. Maybe it's a single button, or maybe I don't have everything I need here. I need a little extra text there, and I could swap that out with a component in line. This one's not a great example because it didn't import correctly, but I will say just going through some of these, these are real examples that I've been shared by, shared with from uh, Figma designers. So this was, a, um, this was a component that we needed to make. So this is a lot of different things going on with vertical and horizontal auto layout here uh, with a lot of constraints. Here's a constraint on this one here. Uh, I'll leave this for you to poke around and check in the file. Uh, Joey, if you would relink the file again, that would be great just oh, to yeah, see how sure. some of these layouts are pulled off. Awesome, thank you. Uh, let's skip this one. That's not exactly the greatest example. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about um, this idea of creating little bits and pieces inside these components. So this was an example that a designer sent to me and she was trying to figure out like, she has a very complex, this is like an admin card. And this is typically the way that it works uh, is that you have a title and some content. Over here you have like this sort of just box where you put things. It might have an action, but it also might have text. So there's all kinds of things. And she wanted to make this thing into being a uh, like one single component. So this is what we did here is we broke it out into a few things. For one, what we did is we created uh, our, our stuff here on the top. We created a right action group and this is an auto layout group here. Now this is a fixed width card, so we don't have to worry about uh, whether or not this gets resizable horizontally. But on this right action group in this auto layout frame, um, I actually set it to stretch up and down. So like Joey said, you can always test these things here by creating an instance, and I'm gonna just start typing in here, and you can see that this stretches vertically, uh, is including the border and everything. The other thing that I can do here is I can actually come into this button and I can actually swap this out for something else. Maybe it's something from uh, Joey's base and it just swaps right in there. Uh, the other thing is we can actually swap out the footer if we wanted to. Right here we have this normal footer. Uh, that's all cool and dandy, but what if we wanted something else? Now this is where we went extreme with this component. Notice in the architecture here for this component, you'll see that I created something called a slot. Um, and a slot literally is a component that's just zero height. Um, this is what I put into my components in case I ever need to be like, hey, what if I just put in something totally, like I need some brand new content. So that's what we're doing here. This is what she shared with me is that she said, hey, there's a lot of times where I wanna bring in a table into this. It's like an expanded, more context to this, to this card. So let's do this, let's take this card Let's create an instance of this and watch this in work. Uh, so here's the slot. Now I've got this my data table here, and I'm going to, because it is a component instance, I'm going to come on into uh, this file here, which is card, and I'm going to bring in my data table. Now, because this whole card is set up to be auto layout vertically, as soon as I swap that content out, you can actually see that it changes the whole height of this whole card and swaps into that slot. Now, it even goes down to this level too. I created components out of everything. I've got headers in a, in a, a collapsed row, in an expanded row, and then header uh, sort of value name pairs, uh, key value pairs. But what you can see here is that means I can also go into this expanded row and I could actually swap that out. So this one here, I could actually swap out for a different row. Uh, I just wanted to show that to you because I feel like it showcases that you can do a lot with components. Um, I'm gonna do another quick couple of examples and then we'll move on into uh, one example from Joey and then a bunch of Q&A. Uh, another example that I have in this file is the idea of a tooltip. Uh, there's a little tooltip that I made. It's a single tooltip. Have you ever uh, been in those design systems where it's like, I need a tooltip, but I need to make it have a beak on top or I need to like uh, make, make the little uh, pointer point this way? Smart people probably just create different instances for each of them, but depending on your use cases, you may be able to just like bake those in. So in this case, I can actually turn off the bottom beak and turn on the top beak, or I can go turn off this. Now this is a little bit hard to work with, left and right, I could turn those on as well, or I could turn them all on. This is something I just want you to know so you can have this tool in your toolbox, but 
it may be easier in scenarios where you just literally go swap it out here in a menu. So you might just say tooltip and then swap it out for tooltip bottom, tooltip top. And that, be a, that may be an easier use case for you, but this is something in your toolbox that you can use. Lastly, I'm just going to come into this one uh, because this is one that I uh, really wanted to share with you. Now, if you've ever tried to swap out an icon within your design system, uh, you may, let's just say we have this icon here. We go here, I have this icon and I wanna change the colors to this purple color. Uh, but then all of a sudden I realize, oh, I actually, this isn't the bookmark icon, I need to make it the calendar icon. You may become fr frustrated with the fact that those color overrides do not persist. So hopefully Figma will be working on in the future to persist those color overrides like we do with text and a lot of other things like fills on backgrounds. One way that you can actually do this uh, is to actually create an icon, a wrapper icon component around these. I've literally just put an icon in here and that's what this swap me is. I renamed it to swap me. Now I set a shape mask around this. So essentially a, a group that I actually created a mask out of by clicking mask here. And then up here is the color. Now, how does this work then? If I duplicate this icon, uh, it is a little bit harder to work with, but you can come down here, you can lock this layer here, and of course you can just swap it out. I would only recommend this method if you're using some kind of a design system that has like tons of different colors for your icons, maybe it's a very spirited design system. If you only have one or two different color variations, like an on light or an on dark background, then I would absolutely suggest just creating two different ones, right? Like bookmark dark, bookmark light, something like that. But this is another tool that you can use. This is a complex component stream. So if I wanna change my colors now, I can easily just change this color. And if I wanna swap this out, let's change this color here, boom. I will come into here and come to the swap me area. And I'm just going to change this out to a different icon. So let's just say this. And of course, now because I'm swapping within this mask, uh, it masks up and the color bleeds through. And I'm even doing two-tone icons here. So this is maybe something that you can use in your arsenal of tools. Uh, Joey, it's on to you. All right, awesome. Uh, let me share. Okay, so I, this is kind of the last example that I wanted to leave everyone with, but this is something um, if you're prototyping pretty often uh, that I found to be really, really helpful. So the idea here, and sorry for the really simple design, but the idea here is you've pulled in a component from your, from your component library, from your team library. So in this case, I've got this bottom navigation bar component. If I click go to main component, it's going to open up a new tab uh, for a new file for where this uh, component was actually created in. And the idea here is, you know, for prototyping, we might be making copies and kind of placing these um, in each one of these here like that. Um, and then, you know, you, you like often we'll have to like, uh, if you go into prototype mode and you want to link these up to different pages in the design, you have to kind of do them all individually. So the idea is to actually undo this. So I'm just going to delete these for now. And with this instance that you've pulled in from your library, to actually just right click and make a new component of this. So now you have a local component in your file that has an instance inside. And the reason that I want to do this is if we take this component and we copy it, and I'm just going to paste it in this one and using my alignment tools, place it at the bottom here, paste here, paste here. Well, now if I go to this component in prototyping tab, and for now I'm just going to wire these up really quick. So I'm going to say when the user taps this first icon here, we want to take them, take them to this page. Uh, when they click on this bookmark icon here, we'll take them to this page. When we click on this bell icon here, we want to take them to this third page perhaps. And now if I actually click on the canvas, all of these are wired up based on that that like connection that was just created once. And this is so cool because you don't have to publish these components out, but they're really gonna help you like, you know, let's say for example, oh, we actually need to break this uh, this instance, or maybe we, we need to relink this one to go to another, um, to another area in the prototype. Well, I can do that. And then let's actually for now I'll just show you, like if I were to click on this and delete that connection, these are no longer wired up. So uh, yeah, kind of the last trick that I wanted to leave everyone with, but um, you can imagine things like buttons or new actions or search fields to really take advantage of this. Um, and someone asked about, can you change them to the active color? Well, you could really easily swap these. So, uh, or not swap them, but I could customize them. So 
because these are all instances, I could actually go in and I could uh, copy the style of this one. And for this one to be selected, I could go in and, and paste this in just like that. Um, and I could do the same thing here to kind of mimic that up. So copy the style here and go back and we can paste that style there just like that. I'm just using option control C and D for that. Um, but yeah, that's really how I'd approach something like this. And now when you're actually prototyping, of course, these are all going to be wired up. So uh, that's my maybe most complex component example of the day. <laughs> awesome. I think people love that. I remember when I first learned, I love that too. So we've got a lot of questions. Uh, I say we're going to give about 10 minutes to this. I'm going to let, I'm going to just rattle off the questions to Joey. Uh, and if you need me to yeah. try to answer, let me know, Joey. But I'm just going to keep them coming until best. we can... Let's get through them. Let's get yeah. through them. Okay, let's go with Veronica's. I hope Veronica's still here. Um, do you have any advice about saving versions of components? Good question. Um, you know, to be honest, I like to use version history quite a bit. So uh, just a, a quick tip is like, whenever you do publish components out of your uh, team library file, on each component push, it'll create a new point in version history. So if I were to actually, let's pretend that I want to make this maybe a file. So I'm going to go to the assets tab and I think this will work. I can publish this out. Um, let me move it to a team real quick. Um, can I do this? No, I'm on a different account. Essentially, when you would actually publish a file, you'll see a little dialog that says, uh, are there any notes that you want to add for this component push? And when you add notes inside of there, uh, that's going to be shared in version and history. And I think that's probably the easiest way to do something like that at the moment, just so you can see on every component update that you've had, you can see exactly what changed in that change log. Awesome. Okay, let's just hit a few more. Um, yeah. Let's see. There's so many that we're not going to be able to get to them. Um, uh, Joseph asked, there's a few questions about this. Like, would you recommend grid for components over, like, when would you recommend grid for components over auto layout? Yeah, so I would recommend a layout grid um, whenever you have something like this that you're going to stretch and shrink and you want these to always work. Um, auto layout is going to work really well if you have, for example, like just to show you, I can maybe break this one, I can go in and I can make this here an auto layout container. This is going to work nicely because it's going to really easily kind of predict the alignment for things, but it actually is going to be a little bit tricky when you want to stretch and shrink this um, like that. So that's when I would use uh, layout grids just to really make sure that you can uh, keep that to keep those those spacing elements as uh, kind of evenly as distributed as possible. Um, one quick thing that I do want to share about auto layout is it doesn't just have to be used for components. Like for example, one thing that I, I did with this file was I really quickly kind of wanted to clean this up just to present it a little bit nicely. And you could imagine maybe a file where you have something like this and these are all kind of spaced out and it could be frames, it could be elements that you just want to tidy up. Um, one tip is to actually select all of these, do shift A or tap shift A to apply auto layout. I can over here change my padding or my, change my, um, the spacing between the items with that just like that. I can go in, I can add all of these to the top. And now if I want, I can turn off auto layout and break that frame. And now I've got these all tidied up really easily. So that's something that I use a lot just to keep files clean and to kind of take advantage of the auto layout feature in maybe a way that's a little bit different than you think. Great. All right. Let's, um, uh, yes. Um, I'll just answer this one really quickly. Uh, Ola Wele, hopefully I didn't butcher that. Uh, is there a hack to use auto layout for the sweet button Raji created? Uh, well, with the very simple uh, example that I made, uh, you could actually, and I was actually trying to type an answer to this too. You could actually, uh, create little shapes of the butt caps. I just wanted to say butt caps, but, uh, you could create little shapes of the butt caps for each one of the, uh, the sides. And then you could just tack those onto the end of the auto layout. But in the bottom example there with that Joey's showing, uh, that one's a little bit more difficult because now you have these like double borders. So you've got a lot going on there. So it's a little bit more difficult. All right, let's see another one if we can do. Um, uh, can you show, oh, how do you copy and paste styles? Can you show that again, Joey? Oh yeah, sure. So, um... Maybe I'll just create, I'll just create something above here. So if you have a rectangle like this, and let's say you, it's red, and maybe you have a stroke around it, something like that, and you have a new rectangle down here, if you want to apply this style to this rectangle, you can always right click, go to copy and paste, and then copy properties. But a shortcut is Option Command C. So I can click on this, Option Command C, click on this rectangle, Option Command D, and it's going to paste all of those styles, no matter what you have, right on top of the new element. 
Awesome. Uh, do you, okay, the next one we have is, do we have a best practices for tables? And if so, I think you had a link, Joey, for like, a, like an auto layout table from the community that maybe we could just yeah. uh, shove into the chat. That would be awesome. Yep, I will share that. So I went to community, I typed in tables, and the one that I was kind of referencing for today, um, there's actually a lot in here. So I'll grab this link real quick and I'll, I'll share this out. Uh, uh, copy that link, paste it there for everyone. Here's another good one, and I think we have just a few minutes, but Singyu asked, uh, can we make the navbar component have a hover effect while we link them to different screens? So can we demonstrate like a hover effect on a navbar and then that hover clicking it and going to something? Yeah, um, let's see. So uh, probably the navbar they were describing was something like, uh, would it be something like this, Raji, do you think, and, and doing a quick hover? Yeah, I think so. I think that could work. Yep. Okay. So I think how I'd approach this, I'm just going to do this live with everyone. Uh, how I would approach this is I would have maybe um, navbar, and I'll just call this default. And then I'll have another one over here. Uh, this is an instance, of course. And I'll just call this navbar slash, um, just call it hover. And I think what I would do here is just to kind of demonstrate, maybe we have one of these items over here kind of as an active hover state. So we can add a, a quick little like drop shadow on it. Again, this isn't perfect. This is a mobile nav bar and you probably won't do hovers on, on mobile, of course, but just to kind of show what this would look like. And I can also turn off, um, let's turn off clip content there just so we can see that drop shadow. So I think what I would do is uh, I would go into prototyping mode just like this. I would set up a new interaction for this one where on hover, I want the user to go from this one here to this one. And instead of a click navigation, I just wanna do a hover action, or sorry, a click interaction. I just wanna change this to be a hover interaction. Um, you also have all of these others here. So it could be a drag, it could be a press, mouse enter, leave up or down. Uh, but I'll do a hover and then on hover will be taken to here. And I can share this out really quickly. So let's load the prototype for this file. And now if I hover over, we can see that on that hover, it's going to present that for us. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps. Awesome. I think based on that, we have so many other questions. But uh, I, I think we're going to have to be done uh, just to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Joey, for all of your sort of prowess on this and for sharing. And I want to thank everyone for like the myriad of amazing questions and just generally like digging in with us and loving on Figma and trying to do some yeah. cool stuff. Um, Joey, got any words? Uh, no, just like, thank you everyone. Uh, it's really, I don't know, it really recharges me to do these and to see everyone and to, uh, to share this stuff. So I really appreciate you kind of spending an hour with us and uh, just hope everyone continues to stay safe and healthy and uh, yeah, feel free to always reach out if you have questions or thoughts or uh, feedback. Uh, we'd love to hear from you either way. All right, and I'm just going to put this link in here one more time. The recording will be available at this link here at our YouTube page, uh, probably within a week. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming in. Uh, loved having you, loved doing this. Uh, and until next time, uh, office hours are closed. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.